Dr. Goldstein is dialing in from Israel, where he himself has been hosting a really terrific uh, conference on pharmacoeconomics today. It's supper time, it's dinner time, evening in Israel. Dr. Goldstein is a medical oncologist and internist at the Rabin Medical Center in Tel Aviv, where he's also um, an adjunct uh, faculty member at uh, Tel Aviv University a Medical School. He's written extensively and really been a thought leader on uh, thinking about how we reduce waste, um, particularly in, um, in oncology. Dan, thanks Thank so much for much. being here. We really appreciate it. Okay. We know it's nighttime and, and you're hosting a conference Thank you. today. So thanks. Yeah, well, okay. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen okay? We can. Yes. You can? Okay, perfect. So thank you very much, first of all, uh, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I've been hosting a, what we're calling Interventional Pharmacoeconomics, um, a, a Zoom conference together with collaborators all over the world over the past couple of days. Um, so this is, uh, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, so um, uh, just a bit of background, if you're a bit confused by me, by my accent and like how I'm commenting on America as well, my background is that I'm from the UK. I was in the States for nine years. Um, before moving to Israel five years ago, where I practiced as a medical oncologist, um, internist, and uh, was in was uh, in at Montefiore in the in New York, and then at, um, at Emory uh, down in the deep south. Um, so I don't want to do this type of research. This is what I said uh, before. Um, I studied. Uh, so while I was doing my clinical training. I also have a strong interest in health economics and public health uh, through my many years of training. And during my fellowship, I was studying, I started studying cost effectiveness and published many, many papers from the US perspective about cost effectiveness, budget impact, affordability, many, many different things related to this. And I became frustrated uh, because it, uh, and actually part, part of it was frustrated by one comment by talking with Deb Schrag, uh, one of the ASCO meetings where Deb Schrag said to me, where Deb said, um, um, you know, doing cost effectiveness, I don't know, it doesn't really move the needle very much. So I took that um, deep into my heart and I was in deep pain by that. So I hope you'll be satisfied now, Deb. I've started trying to do stuff that hopefully moves the needle a little bit more. Um, so, um, uh, although we'll see if it really does or not. So, um, why? Because this is the second best option. And as Don has already said, the issue is the is is things at a much higher level. But of all of these discussions about, you know, it's been in the papers every day for years about prices are too high, there should be value-based prices, they shouldn't. And has anything actually changed? And I find it very hard to see that anything has actually changed, um, particularly in the US. Um, and so that's why I started looking for opportunities to save money while maintaining efficacy. To me, that was the second best option, but that was why I started hunting around for where the options lay. Um, because is it really the related to, is the cost really related to the liquid inside the vial? Absolutely not. The liquid inside the vial is irrelevant. It's all related to uh, politi politics and how the prices are set and, um, uh, uh, and many, many, many other things. But as as far as I was able to see, I was not able to have any impact on those higher level things. Therefore, I started focusing on the liquid inside the vial, essentially viewing the liquid as li small pieces of small bits of gold, liquid gold, and seeing how we could save uh, in the liquid a bit more carefully. Um, and so the only response, because of the because of the prices were escalating. Um, was to focus on the liquid. And an example of why um, this, my notion, of, the notion of focusing on the prices um, was of little impact was, here's a drug, regorafenib, um, approved by the FDA, uh, funded by Medicare, prescribed by clinicians in the US, coming out at 900,000 US dollars per quality, way, way, way above any threshold that would be considered reasonable in any country in the world. 
So let's focus on the liquid. And here was uh, Len Saltz, who, who wrote an editorial on one of my pieces of work on cost effectiveness. And this was similar to what Deb said about my work, cost effectiveness research. He said, it's a very interesting paper, but cost effectiveness research has become an academic exercise of no meaningful consequence. And so might as well focus on something else. So really, I don't want to be doing this, but this is the second best option. So here's the introduction. So this was the famous paper by Peter Back and his colleagues uh, published in the BMJ about four or five years ago, showing that there was approximately $3 billion of wastage in the US due to oversized vials. So uh, the ideal situation would be not to focus on this liquid inside the vial. The ideal situation would be to recognize that we could save money by playing with the liquid inside the vial and trying to save and do different things with weight-based dosing or whatever, but make a market access agreement with the payer or the, or the between the payer and the manufacturer beforehand to get a, a discount, a deeper discount in order not to have to play around with all this vial sharing. Now, I have a suspicion that this may be happening in some countries, um, uh, obviously not happening in the United States. Um, the, uh, you know, it's obviously a very depressing situation in the United States, not only because of uh, the drug pricing situation, but many other situations. Um, but uh, this is what my ideal uh, scenario would be. So I'm gonna talk about the example of uh, the pembrolizumab, um, which is Keytruda, which is a big blockbuster immunotherapy drug, which is used for uh, many types of cancer now. And this, is basically how I've learned about the whole situation. So pembrolizumab was initially developed with clinical trials dosed at two milligrams per kilogram every three weeks. Um, and then they, uh, and the first approvals by the FDA were based on this dosage. Then all of the immunotherapy manufacturers decided that they would um, change and use fixed dosing instead of weight-based dosing. The claims were that it would be more convenient, less hassle for the pharmacists having to play with different vial sizes, and it would just simply be more convenient. But how did they change the subsequent dosage? They used pharmacokinetic modeling, et cetera, et cetera, and came out with a new dosage, which was gonna be 200 milligrams every three weeks. And from about 2014 onwards, all new clinical trials were using this specific dosage. And then subsequently, the first trial, uh, the first uh, drug approval as a result of this was in was in first line lung cancer. And then retroactively, they changed the, the previous approvals, which were too mixed per kick. And they showed with PK models, the FDA agreed, the company agreed that it was the same efficacy. And the drug is priced per milligram when you look at the Medicare ASP. But if you think about an average patient, an average patient of 75 kilos, which and we checked weights in the US, average patient 75 kilos, so two mix per kg, they need only 150 milligrams. So we said, hold on a minute, if we go back to weight-based dosing and we use uh, two mix per kg instead of 200, which is what they're recommending, we can calculate it and we can figure out how much can be saved. And we published this paper that showed that just in this one indication in lung cancer, we could save 0.8 billion US dollars annually um, if they used two mix per kg instead of 200 mix fix. However, there's a snag, and the snag was related to the vial sizes. Originally on the market were 50 milligram and 100 milligram vials, but once they started with this uh, maneuver to fix dosing, they removed the 50 milligram vials from the market. They started in the US removing them, uh, and then they moved to other countries in the world. So then it made it more difficult because if you have a 175 kilo patient and you want to give them only 150 milligrams, you can't do it with what the, with the vial sizes that are available. So then the question comes, can we do vial um, sharing? So here's the drug itself. It's Keytruda. It's one of the top selling drugs in 2018. Here, in, uh, in, uh, it, was, it was $4 billion sales. It's increasing. It's estimated that this is, may even overtake Humira, uh, although maybe not now, given that their patent protections have been upheld. Um, but it's going to hit number one or number two as, a, as a, uh, um, in, the, in the top selling drugs in the US. Um, here's a little update in 2020, just, just as a little, uh, as we've actually found a new solution to this. They, they then 
changed the dosage and they said, well, we want to make it more convenient. They used PK models. And then they said, well, let's use 400 milligrams every six weeks. And they got it quickly approved during Corona because then it was more convenient for patients, safer not to have to come to the hospital every week. However, we then argue, we look back and we just published this paper a few weeks ago in JAMA Oncology. We looked and we said, hold on a minute, let's look at the PK. And the PK is fine if we give four mg per kg every six weeks. And if we do that, any patient that's 75 kilos uh, needs only uh, uh, 300 milligrams instead of 400 milligrams. And they therefore can get three vials and the vials are in 100 milligram vials. So they can get, so, and actually with the accepted rounding rules uh, by the by the pharmacy associations that actually goes up to 82.5 kilograms. So a large proportion of the patients receiving this drug can get can get it uh, only 300 milligrams instead of 400 without having to do any vial sharing. No no mixing of vials. No patient grouping. Nothing else. So so that so we felt like this was a big um, an important thing to publish a few weeks ago. Um, and just of note, the global annual revenue for pembrolizumab is currently 11 billion US dollars. So let's go to vial sharing. And this links to some of the things that um, Don had to say as well. So first of all, um, patients, in order to be able to do vial sharing, if you, just, if you have to do vial sharing, you've got no options. The, in my mind, when we've looked at this and we've talked to um, healthcare payers and different people all around the world, Patients in a clinic need to be from a single payer. It won't work in a regular US hospital setting where patients are coming with one patient insured by Blue Cross Blue Shield, one insured by United, one insured by Medicaid, you know, and a whole mixture because they need to have all the same agreements about what happens with the leftover, you know, how you do the vial sharing. But there are hospitals in the US where this would definitely work. There's definitely a clear incentive in the US for hospitals like the veterans, uh, the, the VA, uh, to do the vial sharing, as well as uh, for Kaiser uh, and places like that to, to, to do it. The financial incentives, in my mind, have to be aligned, and we've talked about that. The JW modifier, in my mind, uh, is a disincentive for, for, for vial sharing. The fact that you can get reimbursed for any wasted drug doesn't seem to encourage uh, not wasting the drug. We actually performed like a a small study that we never published, and we interviewed about 10, 15 um, pharmacists from all over the US, public, private, all different payers, uh, all different types of institutions. And actually, we found it was all over the map as to what they were doing with wastage. Some were, some were being careful, some weren't being careful, some were being careful with wastage that was irrelevant because it was just pennies. Um, and some places were properly uh, get, filling out the JW modifier stuff, and some weren't. Um, so quite interesting to see that. Um, drug stability is obviously is important as well. And I don't, I'm not sure if I believe everything that's published on the labels of the drugs. So for example, pembrolizumab, um, they say that it can be um, that it's can be used for uh, six hours at room temperature or 24 hours refrigerated. Now I'm going to come back to that piece of data in a few minutes. But trastuzumab, which is Herceptin, can be stored for 28 days. So for 28 days, okay, you need to do vial sharing, but it doesn't matter when the patient's going to come. You don't need to group them all on one day because you've got 28 days to play with. And I think that there's an opportunity here for more research into stability uh, of drug and how long it's stable for. Um, but if, if, if it is a short stability period, then you, need, you may need to do group infusions on specific days of the week. Um, now, Don talked about this, and I agree entirely with what he said. Is vial sharing possible with single-use vials? It's the safety issue, and the safety issue will be the trump card. And everywhere in health, I, I support safety. I think safety is, is crucial, and we need to focus on safety, but not at the ultimate expense of everything. So here, if there's a possible, very rare uh, possibility of having some type of an infection versus saving huge amounts of resources that can be redistributed and used for other services, whether or not it's geriatric care or other things. If it's, uh, I, and when you're looking at it from a populational health perspective, a, what a possibility of a rare possibility of, a, of, of an issue of safety doesn't automatically trump every other consideration. So CDC says, no, you can't uh, uh, share vials. CMS says possibly you can. And I'm still confused with regard to what's published with regard to vial sharing. If the issue is drug stability or drug sterility, 
Um, and I, I, I'm still struggling to understand where, what the, what if the focus is purely one or the other or where it lies. Now, here, this is a study published just a few weeks ago about nivolumab, and they, and they uh, from a Japanese group, and they looked at all of these. Uh, they looked at the stability of nivolumab, and remember that pembrolizumab, they say you can't use it after 24 hours. Here, nivolumab, they showed that over, after 28 days, and it doesn't matter if it's refrigerated, non-refrigerated, the drug is completely stable after 28 days, um, which is helpful for, the, uh, for pursuing viral sharing. Now, so that's where I say cost of convenience, cost of minor safety risk, do, it doesn't automatically um, uh, rule out any possibility of doing viral sharing because you have to think about the trade-off, the opportunity cost, and the net health impact. Uh, if we can, with the money saved, if we can employ many, many more nurses to help patients with side effects and all sorts of other things, it's most likely that's going to have a positive net health impact. So I was asked specifically to look at different health uh, of different countries' approaches. Um, so I think it's I, I've done a little bit of looking into it. I can tell you from our perspective in Israel. I think it very much depends on mechanisms of how the drug is paid for. It depends on who's paying, and it depends if the payer pays per vial or per milligram. Um, so this is the Canadian uh, data, um, and Canadians uh, initiated a full big investigation. This is a 50-page review all about the dosing and timing of these immuno-oncology drugs like pembrolizumab. And uh, this is all courtesy of uh, my friend and colleague, Kelvin Chan, uh, who works in this field. He's an oncologist, as well as working on uh, the kind of drug approval and payment system. And so he told me about Ontario, where he works. And there were, there were 10 provinces and three territories. Um, uh, and Cancer Care Ontario accounts for approximately 40% of the population. And they develop policies for hospital reimbursement. Mostly the provinces and territories are aligned, but they don't have to be. And so with regards to weight-based pembrolizumab, most, most provinces use weight-based pembrolizumab because they studied it, they looked at it, and they saw that there was an opportunity to save significant resources. So they went along with that, uh, with that approach. They don't reimburse a wasted drug. Most uh, centers go ahead and use single dose vials. But he said that there are some provinces, for example, Alberta and British Columbia, where they don't. And they have, uh, you know, they've erred on the side of the safety side, um, saying that, you know, uh, they don't, they'll only share uh, within the same day, um, within six hours. Now, something that was also touched on before, if there's a concern about stability or sterility, um, there is what's called a closed system. And these are plastic um, connector systems that are used to give chemotherapy um, that connects the vial to the infusion tubing and they uh, decrease the chance of a cytotoxic chemotherapy being touched by um, the pharmacist and so they were originally developed in that way but they can also be used for um, improving the sterility of uh, if we're using vial sharing with single dose vials and sharing between patients. So there in his hospital in Ontario, they use the closed system to, to increase, to preserve the sterile techniques for vial sharing. Um, and for drugs with short stability, they do do patient grouping um, and treatments on the same day of the week. Um, there was a study just a few days ago from British Columbia. I don't think I need to uh, go too deep into that. Now, what happens in the UK just at this conference, we've had Peter Clark there, who's the head of the Cancer Drug Fund in the UK. Um, and I have a, a good relationship with him, and I discuss with him sometimes different ideas. I've emailed him a few times about this issue of weight-based dosing of, of some of the checkpoint inhibitors. And he has... Uh, now, bear in mind that all drug prices in the UK, and in fact, in most countries in the world, are uh, hidden in secrecy. There's many... Uh, secrets regarding the prices. So whatever price you see is usually not true. There's subsequent negotiations that take place. And that's specific. That's definitely the case in the UK. Now, I've emailed um, my friends in the UK a few times to ask them, what do you think about weight-based dosing? Wouldn't you want to do it? Wouldn't it make sense for you to do it? And, and, and I haven't re received replies from them. Maybe they just don't like me. But the only thing I can think is that possibly um, they're doing uh, market access, uh, uh, so they've done a subsequent market access agreement with the company in order to negotiate a deeper discount uh, in order to not go ahead with 
weight-based dosing. I might be wrong, but to me, it would seem a very sensible thing to do. And, and here in Israel, they we even entered into that, and they almost were going to um, go ahead and give us deeper discounts. Um, uh, they were considering deeper discounts in order to not do this weight-based dosing. So Israel, uh, our policymakers, whatever happens in the U US, you have to um, understand that whatever happens in the US has massive implications for the rest of the world. Um, and policymakers outside of the US uh, are cautious when it comes to going against what's on an FDA label. We're gradually making process. We now are implementing in Israel weight-based dosing of pembrolizumab. And in our, in my health system, which covers 55% of the population, we stand to save approximately 50 million shekel per year uh, as a result of it. Uh, how much is that in US dollars? I can't remember. Uh, 10, uh, 20 million uh, US dollars per year. Uh, Low-income countries, to me, most of this issue, uh, I'm just covering other countries that I was asked to cover. Um, most of these drugs are essentially not affordable. They're priced so highly, even if they have a 50% discount. For most low-income countries, that's still way, way out of reach for the general population to be able to afford. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to stop. I had a few other slides here uh, showing things about uh, the doses but I'll just show one last thing up here. This is nivolumab for kidney cancer. If anybody believes that the doses are the appropriate doses, the doses of these checkpoint inhibitors are far higher than necessary. Here, the approved doses is approximately two milligrams per kilogram, but we can see that even 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram provides the same level of efficacy as these drugs. So there's a massive opportunity for dose reduction of these drugs. And with that, I think I've hit my 20 minutes, so I will take a break there. Dr. Goldstein, thank you so much. We really appreciate your remarks, and I'm so glad that you, um, of all the impactful work that you've um, done, thank you.